Priyamada Radha Krishnan. So I request Dr. Amrish to introduce the moderator of the day. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Kalaiwani. Uh, good evening to everybody in India and uh, good morning to everybody here in USA. Uh, I know we have some um, guests joining in from Chicago. Well, a, a good welcome to them as well. Uh, we are looking forward to this uh, talk today. And uh, we have a moderator today, Dr. Sudha. And Dr. Sudha is a pediatric nephrologist at Apollo Children's Hospital in Chennai, and she has more than a decade of experience in pediatric nephrology. Her clinical interests include nephrotic syndrome and chronic kidney disease in children. Uh, she has had many major achievements in the last uh, decade. She was solely responsible for upgrading the pediatric dialysis unit at Mehta Children's Hospital. And she also established the International Society of Nephrology Sister Renal Center program in collaboration with Queensland's Children's Hospital, Brisbane, Australia. This uh, SRC went up to the level B and uh, kudos to her for doing that. Uh, she also partnered the introduction of structured training fellowship program in pediatric nephrology at Mehta's hospital. She has been a great organizer of a number of uh, conferences, especially the Neph Kids from 2016 till up till date, and she was also a winner of the World Kidney Day in 2017. She's also a member of a number of uh, professional societies and also serve as a past executive committee member for Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology. She has published 20 articles in national and international journals and has eight chapters in textbook. We really are excited to have you, Dr. Sudha, here. I will hand over the session to you from here on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amrish. And uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to uh, thank and congratulate uh, Kalaiwani for uh, uh, putting up a lot of time uh, and effort in conducting this uh, webinar on CACPUT. And uh, today, there's a slight modification uh, in the talk. The first speaker for today is going to be Dr. Uh, Sri Pati. And uh, he's the senior consultant, pediatric urologist, and robotic uh, so, uh, surgeon. Uh, actually, he needs no introduction. And... Uh, is the director of the Pediatric Urology Fellowship Program at Apollo Children's Hospital, Chennai, and the past president of the Indian Association of Pediatric Surgeons. Is the adjunct professor of the Tamil Nadu of Penjar Medical University, and he has more than 65 publications in articles and book chapters. And uh, today's topic uh, is on uh, the CACUT, and we all know that more than 20% of the congenital malformations uh, are uh, CACUT, and it is one of the major causes of uh, CKD in uh, children. And hence, the prenatal diagnosis and early intervention will actually help to improve the natural history of these uh, diseases. And uh, so we have uh, Dr. Tripathi uh, to enlighten us on the management of posterior urethral valve or the urological aspect, and also to share his experience about the robotic surgeries uh, in CACUT. Over to you, sir. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudha. So, <clears throat> so I'm always, uh, 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 I'm so happy to see uh, Professor Namalwar in the, uh, in the, uh, in this meeting. And a lot of what I know in pediatric urology is uh, due to his uh, very kind uh, teaching and his uh, correction when you're wrong. And I'm amazed at the type of people who take a pediatric nephrology. I always think they are the sort of the cream, the brainy guys, so to say, who take a pediatric nephrology. And it's been a great journey. It's been about three decades and it's been a great journey. So what I thought I will do today is talk about the management of PUV, the urology perspective. Dr. Kalevani Ganesan has been uh, in the forefront in, uh, you know, in starting this uh, webmaster series and uh, getting me involved in this. And uh, she's given me two topics, the management of PUV, the urology perspective, and the robotic surgery in Kakut, and I'll take them up one by one. So first, I start off by giving you an idea of the type of experience we have. We have about 102 valve fulgurations that we have done from 2015 onwards, of which newborns have formed a considerable number. Primary fulgurations in infants and older children have been about 44. Redo fulgurations in older children with or without vesicostomy or urethrostomy closure have been 24. We have diverted three children, loop urethrostomy, and we have dealt with two severe urethral structures, which are the outcome of PUV fulguration. 
So this is just to give you an idea of the sort of background we have in valves. Apart from that, as a tertiary referral center, we get so many children who have been treated elsewhere for us to manage. So what I thought I will do today is first indicate to you what we would do. I'm not going into the prenatal management because that's a whole topic by itself. We are going to take it in the postnatal period. We antenatally diagnose and counsel the parents. And then wherever they are born, we ask them to, to, to transfer to our care at birth. This was what we were doing in Child's Trust. And this is what we do, the, what we were doing in Dr. Mehta's. And the same thing that we do in Apollo Children's. Thereafter, we do a sonogram to confirm the valves. We do a serum chemistry, but we don't place too much emphasis on it. We ask the NICU people to assess the babies. And then on day two or day three, once everyone agrees, we take the child to the operating room, do a compression cystogram on the table, uh, document a valve, and then proceed on a reimplant. Now, this is something that I'm very particular about. And I keep telling everybody, before I know that it's a valve, I must see an MCU that you have done before to confirm that it's a valve. Because all too often, people talk about valves, but in actually you have a look inside, it's not a valve. The only difference between us and all other centers is if the child is stable, we do not catheterize. We do not catheterize. So what do we do? How do we proceed? So, so what we do is we just puncture the full bladder and uh, with barbitage, we mix the urine and the contrast. And then we press the suprapubic region and take one picture. And you can see here is the picture, the dilated posterior urethra, the narrow anterior urethral stream, the open bladder neck, the rigid bladder neck, a bladder, and reflux of urine on one side. We're not bothered about the reflux. What we want to really know is whether it's a valve or not. Then we go ahead and do a valve ablation, catheterize the child for three days, and then the valve uh, fulguration is done. We use a, a newborn cystoscope, which is a 6, 7.5 composite cystoscope produced by Wolf. Of course, every other company also has this, has this uh, cystoscope. The reason why I'm talking about this is, this is a scope which does not need the urethra to be dilated. We have time and again seen people who do not have the right equipment and go on dilating the urethra to a maximal level, creating a lot of strictures in the process. So what we do is we take care to see that we do not dilate the urethra at all, but instead we pass a scope that can easily negotiate the urethra. And then generally we use a bug B electrode to fulgurate the valve. I've just got a small video of a cold knife cutting a valve to give you an idea what a valve looks like. Now, if you do not catheterize a newborn with PUV, you will all always see only a type 3 valve. So really the classification of valves into type 1, type 2, type 3 this is, is, seems uh, frivolous because if you do not catheterize them, they are all membranes with a hole underneath. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a little bit of, yeah. So they're all membranes with the hole underneath. If you can see that that is your valve, that is the hole there. And then what we are using is we're using the cold knife to cut in the 12 o'clock position. And basically we are making an opening there. And we also, each time we cut, we also try and pass the cystoscope through to in order to enlarge the opening. And then there it is, we have, we have cut the valve at the 12 o'clock. And this much is enough for a newborn. You don't have to do anything more. We go inside. We look at the vermontanum. That is your vermontanum. We look at the urethral sphincter. We make sure everything is perfect. And then we come out, catheterize, and our work is done. We press the bladder. We get a stream of urine. If there is a delay in fulguration, what do you do? If the child is not ready for the OR, we would catheterize and wait. And here for the surgeons in the audience, I would say this is something that cannot be relegated to the registrar. It has to be done by the consultant. It's a single pass catheter attempt. Usually a six French feeding tube will go. And you have to, sometimes you might need to put a finger in the rectum. You, you can ask somebody who's nearby to just put a little finger in the rectum to push the tip of the catheter from the posterior urethra and negotiate it into the bladder. And once it is inside, you fix the whole thing very securely. And in the OR, of course, you do a contrast study on the table, confirm valves and proceed with fulguration. To the question, when will you divert? We would divert if the newborn was less than two kilograms in weight in which the scope, which is six friends, cannot be easily passed. Having said that, today I'm aware that a 4.5 French scope in Wolf is available. But as somebody in a teaching unit who's been running a teaching program for about 10 years now, 
The smaller and more slender the scope is, the more easily it will break when it is used by the, by the fellows and trainees. So actually going for smaller and smaller equipment sometimes is counterproductive. Severe urosepsis with dilated tortuous upper tracts with debris not responsive to catheterization is definitely an indication for diversion. A very sick child who will not tolerate prolonged anesthesia, definitely an indication. The non-availability of a confident anesthesiologist. This is especially for people who are in the periphery or a surgeon who's not confident of handling a newborn. I've had situations where the newborn has been caught in a turf war between two units and has suffered in the process. So these are all situations where I think it is better to divert rather than attempt a primary fulguration. If you do a diversion, what exactly should you consider? Should it be a vesicostomy or should it be a urotrostomy? Personally, I would prefer urotrostomy because it's quick. It provides effective decompression of the upper tracts, particularly in sepsis and tortuous ureters. However, undiversion in a urotrostomy can be difficult and can actually pose a dilemma. The when of undiversion is a big question. Vesicostomies, PUV bladders are thick-walled and the complications of vesicostomy are stenosis, prolapse and retraction. Actually, in, the, in Journal of Pediatric Urology in 2014, from Nigeria, they published 35 children who had vesicostomies. Every one of them had problems. I'm just going to di digress a little and give you one vesicostomy problem, which we encountered, just to tell you that you should not take this very easily. Here is a child, newborn PUV. The child had PUV fulguration and supposedly the plan was to do a circumcision, but they also did a vesicostomy. The vesicostomy after that was redone. And during redoing the vesicostomy, they dilated or probed the left vesicuretric junction. And this left vesicuretric junction subsequently closed off. And the child finally became anuric, had an open vesicostomy and a dry fulguration. So this is one of the things that you should never do. You either do a vesicostomy, leave the valve intact, or you fulgurate the valve and don't divert. You can't do both. If you do both, what will happen is it becomes a dry fulguration and that area can stricture or narrow. So here was the child who, uh, who presented to us with a left nephrostomy, an open vesicostomy and a dry fulguration. We did a left VUJ stenting, did a vesicostomy closure, removed the nephrostomy and did a right loop urotrostomy. The right, right side was a defunct kidney and this was the only functioning kidney. Six weeks after DJ stent removal, the VUJ closed off again. The child became anuric. We re-established a nephrostomy. Subsequently, I had to go back and do a urethrovesical anastomosis, not a reimplant, just joining the ureter to the bladder. And eight weeks later, removed the, removed the stent. A year later, the serum creatinine was 0.3. The right urethrostomy was being used for nighttime drainage with very few voids from below. At three years, the parents wanted to put the child in school and wanted the right urotrostomy closed. Eurodynamics showed a poorly compliant bladder. And the child was in grade 2, 3 CKD by now. We gave Botox two times in order to improve the bladder compliance and continued with nighttime drainage with a free leak during the day. We did periodic urodynamics to assess the bladder. At six years, the bladder was severely non-compliant with a persistent left VUR, a defunct right kidney. So I told the parents there is no point in waiting anymore. So we did an augmentation ileocystoplasty, a right ureteric metrophenol with an extravesical reimplant. This time we reimplanted the left ureter because the bladder capacity was fairly adequate and we were confident of a good result. I want to tell you that what should have been a primary fulguration and an uneventful outcome has resulted in a child having an augmentation at six years of age and being committed to a lifetime of clean intermittent catheterization and nighttime drainage. I just want you to imagine the scenario that has been created because of a surgical misadventure. After fulguration, in any case, we would do a renal sonogram a month later, look for upper tract decompression. A VCUG stroke cystoscopy at three months to check adequacy of fulguration and reflux status. A DMSA approximately a year later. And of course, we do the routine follow-up at every six-monthly visit, especially the ultrasound at six-monthly intervals. Now, the biggest question that is being asked to us all the time is, can we rely on MCU to decide the need for redo scopy? Should we really do a scopy on everybody? Here is an example. This was a child that we handled just about a week ago. This is the child 
at birth, you can see that's the compression cystogram showing you the dilated posterior urethra, the narrow anterior urethral stream, the hypertrophied bladder neck, the trabeculated bladder, confirming that this child had a posterior urethral valve. A year later, the bladder has increased in capacity and you can see the posterior urethra has almost come back to normal dimensions. Looking at this, you would feel the posterior urethra and the anterior urethra almost are similar. But this child had a 40 mils post void residue. So we did a cystoscopy. And here is the result of the cystoscopy. That's your sphincter. That's your veru. Nothing has been done to it. We had a small sort of fold on one side, which we cut. But the major valve was at the 7 o'clock here, at this particular point where we cut using a, using a, a cutting current. And then, as is, as is our routine, we reverse the hook, go to the roof, and there you can see a substantial chunk of the valve that needed to be cut. So the answer is, after a newborn fulguration, you would do both a VCUG and a check cystoscopy. So, and this is the position of Great Ormond Street also. Now we come to the million dollar question, anticholinergics in PUV. There was a time when we were putting anticholinergics in everyone because we thought they were thick walled bladders working against outlet resistance. And we thought, you know, there is detrusor sphincter dysynergia till about three to four years of age. So anticholinergics would be useful in normalizing the bladder. This is what we thought. We subsequently learned that long-term anticholinergic usage is not very good. The only problem with anticholinergics is anticholinergics are very difficult. Once you start, it is difficult to discontinue. I've had scores of patients where the parents would just start their children on anticholinergics if the children have dribbling. The one thing that disturbs parents enormously is not that their children are watching TV or their phones all the time. It is if they dribble, then they become very upset. What we do know now is anticholinergics in the long term not only leads to myogenic failure of the detrusor, but also results in a lot of mental changes. So our current approach is to start anticholinergics only when warranted on neurodynamic study. So here is uh, an example assessing the need for anticholinergics. This was a child who had a fulguration in the newborn period. He'd had an ultrasound at three years of age. He had bladder wall thickening. He was started on anticholinergics very early. He had bladder wall thickening and but a post void of 50 ml. He was seen by one of my colleagues in Bangalore and rightly he stopped the anticholinergics because he felt that this uh, child had a post void residue. He came to us at five and a half years of age. He complained now of wetting. Renal ultrasound showed bilateral ureterohydronephrosis. DMSA showed scarring in one pole in one kidney. The serum creatinine was 0.6 and the calculated creatinine clearance was excellent. The urodynamics, I'm not going to go into urodynamics in great detail because I know Dr. Anita Patel has already spoken to you on urodynamics. So this is a filling phase urodynamics where you can see the PDET and you can see these spikes here. All of them are more than 15 centimeters because we keep our scale at 0 to 50 and these are the ones that are causing the wetting. But this is not enough. You need to do a Euroflow. On a Euroflow, you can see a good inverted bell-shaped curve, an excellent peak flow, no post void residue. So that is the important thing. Now you can restart your anticholinergics. Simultaneously, you encourage double voiding and reinforce constipation treatment. So this is the way that you would go about using anticholinergics. Suppose even with anticholinergics, a child has refractory wetting. What do you do? Here is a child, seven-year-old, who underwent vesicostomy at birth, fulguration at three months of age. He has persistent wetting in spite of maximal anticholinergic therapy. By maximal anticholinergic therapy, I mean the maximum dosage of anticholinergics. There are some people who even start dual anticholinergics. We know that this, we check to see whether the child was concentrating his urine and was not producing large quantities of dilute urine. We did a UDS to assess his bladder status. And you can see again the urodynamics, the PDET line, not only shows a lot of bladder overactivity, but there is a rise in bladder pressure towards the and when the filling phase is finished. So there is a tendency to non-compliance. This is the EMG, which shows periodic activity, not, not great. What we did was we injected 300 units of Botox because this child was having overactivity in spite of maximal anticholinergic therapy. We injected it in submucosally into the detrusor. Nighttime wetting disappeared, daytime wetting became much less. 
Now, this, uh, this is an important thing to know. In a poorly compliant bladder in a PUV, how would you manage? Here is a child who had vesicostomy at birth, PUV fulguration, closure of the vesicostomy at two months. He developed severe upper tract sepsis, underwent left urotrostomy. This was a poorly functioning kidney, 20%. He, the, uro, the urotrostomy was done at four months. The moment you do a urotrostomy, you have both the parents and the grandparents keep on begging you, when are you going to close it? So at two years, they came and asked us, uh, can urotrostomy be closed safely? So we did a urodynamics. You can see how even with 25 mil or 20 mil filling, the pressure is showing such a steep rise. I said at this particular time, this is a non-compliant bladder. Non-compliant bladders are not responsive to botulinum toxin. I did warn the parents, but they were, they were distraught. They wanted something to be tried. So we injected 200 units of Botox into the detrusor. Five months later, we did a UDS again. Has the pressure dropped? No. On the contrary, the compliance has become, non-compliance has become worse. So I told them augmentation is the only answer for this child. So this child underwent an augmentation cholecystoplasty at three years of age. And you can see six months after the augmentation cholecystoplasty, you can see how the pressures have dropped to the baseline. And these contractions that you can see are the peristaltic activity in the colonic segment. The same child at 17 years of age, he came for a pre-transplant evaluation. And here is his urodynamics. The important point to remember is he's been on clean intermittent catheterization and nighttime drainage through an appendix metrophenol for 14 years. And now you can see he has a stable bladder that is fit for transplant. However, he needs CIC for emptying. So the important thing that I want to emphasize here is, I think that is the key thing as far as this talk is concerned, is clean intermittent catheterization and nighttime drainage can work wonders in PUV bladders. The other question that we are often asked is, when do you give alpha blockers and how is it going to help us? Now, alpha blockers sometimes are very useful in resolving persistent upper tract dilatation. For instance, this is a nine-year-old. Right kidney was 9.7 centimeters with a right hydroerythronephrosis, a 30 mil post void, MCU, no VUR. And you can see the uretric dilatation there close to the bladder. We started this child on tamsulosin, 0.2 milligrams at night, uh, encouraged double voiding. And six months later, the right kidney became 8.4 centimeters. And the right ureter was not dilated, no post void. So whenever you have, whenever you feel that you're managing it optimally, but you still have this persistent dilatation with some element of post void, an alpha blocker will help you. We come to the most vexatious question in PUV. How do you manage reflux? Reflux in PUV usually resolves within the first year of life. The resolution of reflux in PUV is unrelated to the grade of reflux. If the, if the reflux is persistent, please consider early urodynamics. So this is quite important to remember. These are all old fashioned articles which give you, uh, which give you a lot of very good statements. Reflux, no matter what the pattern, has not been a significant prognostic factor in PUV. And it is important to remember it. Here is an example. This is a neonate. An MCU, you can see the small bladder. You can see the paraureteric diverticulum. You can see the massive reflux. You can see the splayed out calluses. And you can't even recognize it as a kidney. Here is a dilated posterior urethra, a narrow anterior urethral stream. After valve fulguration, you can see how the bladder has changed so well. This is at seven months, the bladder has become smooth walled and the reflux has decreased considerably. So we have one, one peculiar situation in PUV, what is called the VURD syndrome, the vesico ureteric reflux dysplasia syndrome, which was the brainchild of Duckett. And Duckett proposed that when you have reflux into a defunct kidney on one side in a PUV, it actually protects the other side. Now, here is an example of a PUV with VUR into a left defunct kidney. This child is 16 years old, right side ureterohydronephrosis. This is the good side with the ureter 1.4 centimeters, a significant post void residue. We filled the bladder up to 450 mils. The child had no sensation of bladder fillness. This is one of the things that happens when you put a child on anticholinergics for a prolonged period of time there is a tendency towards myogenic failure in this particular child. We asked him to void. Here is his uroflow. He voided a large volume, but his peak uroflow is very poor. How do you know that in, an, in one particular case, the peak flow is not very good? Here is the peak flow is about 12. 
If you if 12 into 12 is 144, the voided volume is much more than 144. Therefore, for this particular child, this peak flow is poor. When we did intermittent screening, we found that there was VUR into the defunct kidney at the time of voiding. We haven't been able to capture it in this image. You can see a diverticulum here, and then suddenly it shoots up. So the post void is because of this VUR into the defunct kidney. We started this child on hydrin and a double voiding regimen. We will review him again in six months. If we still have a persistent problem, we will not hesitate to do a mitrofenov and a nighttime drainage. I'm saying this, I'm, I'm uh, emphasizing this defunct kidney reflux, primarily because there is a huge tendency among surgeons to take out a defunct kidney. And please don't do it. Sometimes it's just a pop-off. As long as there is no sepsis and it's not creating any other problems for you, if your nephrologist says there is no problem in leaving it, please leave it alone. That's what I would tell you to do. Now, you, you can tell me, uh, it's all very nice for you to say all this, but what do we do if VUR does not resolve? Please remember, ureterosneosystostomy or ureteric reimplant may hasten lower tract dysfunction and myogenic failure in PUV. So this is this is, has to be written in letters of gold. I would be very, very hesitant to do a reimplant in a PUV bladder. Here is an example of somebody who has been managed without reimplant. Bilateral high-grade VUR in PUV. What is the value of nighttime drainage? This is a 15-year-old with poor function of the right kidney. He had a fulguration at four months of age, a redo fulguration at one and a half years. He had recurrent UTI, high-grade bilateral VUR, large post-void residues. We suggested an appendix mitrofenov. The parents agreed at three years of age and just instituted nighttime drainage. Two UDS, one at nine years of age, another urodynamic study at 15 years of age. This is the urodynamic. It's a video urodynamic study done at nine years of age. The left, you can see this is the detrusor pressure line. Left VUR at 25 mils filling. Right VUR at 75 mils filling. Reaches the kidney at 100 mils filling. When he voids, there is massive reflux into both kidneys when he's training to void. His uroflow is bad. He voided about 200 mils with a 58 mils post void. He was on nighttime drainage. Here is our urodynamic suite, and this is what we do. It's a translucent table top. We use the CM. We do intermittent screening, and we record our pressures here. At 15 years of age, after 12 years of nighttime drainage, you can see here is his detrusor pressure plot, and his bladder is stable. And surprisingly, now, no filling phase VUR. If you remember the early UDS, it was 25 mils on the right side, 75 mils on the left, 100 mils reaching the kidney. And when he was voiding, there was reflux into both kidneys. So it's a stable bladder now with no filling phase VUR and no UTIs, no UTIs. During the voiding, however, his stream was interrupted. He was telling me the urodynamic suite, I'm feeling a little embarrassed. I didn't, it's a big boy. So he said, I can't really void properly. But when we saw his urodynamic uh, pattern, when we saw the intermittent screening, we saw the urine, the bladder neck was having difficulty in opening up. But however, when he was straining, you could see the reflux on the left side. He had voiding phase VUR into the left side. Therefore, we started him on alpha blockers. And we're going to review him again and see how he does. So again, again, the value of nighttime drainage in children with bilateral VUR, and we have managed this child without reimplanting him. So you can turn around and ask me, are you saying that there is no role for VUR surgery in PUV? Not really. If the bladder is stable, especially with unilateral VUR, please do, I'm only asking you to do a video UDS to document pressures, and then you can follow it by a uretric reimplant. However, what I want to stress to you is we prefer an extra vesicle robotic approach. Here is an example. A seven and a half year old child came from overseas with grade four or five VUR with recurrent UTI, and there was a request for surgical correction. So what we did was we did a video UDS on this child, Reflux on the right side at 50, that's at 100. At 250, you can see the ureter is enlarging in size with the reflux. So we did a robotic extravesicle ureteric reimplant. We just confirmed that the bladder pressures were stable. And on a five-year follow-up, this child is doing well. If the bladder is non-compliant or if the bladder shows severe overactivity, we would not do a reimplant on this child. So in conclusion, Newborn PUV fulguration requires equipment and skill. 
Both micturating cystiurethrogram and the chexcopy are needed later in infancy to remove residual valves. The use of anticholinergics as a routine is to be avoided. The use of anticholinergics and especially alpha blockers should be based on well-conducted urodynamic studies. If you ask me, the use of alpha blockers in summary is based on the uroflow. After you start a child on the alpha blockers, the peak flow should double, the post void should halve. That is the, that is the uh, rule as far as alpha blockers is concerned. A VUR in defunct into a defunct kidney may actually serve as a pop-off and its removal may be harmful, especially if done very early. In persistent VUR, you don't need to embark on ureteric reimplantation, but just urodynamic, uh, periodic urodynamic evaluation should be good enough. Non-compliant bladders, however, are have to be augmented without a doubt. The use of a metrophenoff channel for nighttime drainage is immensely beneficial in bladder stabilization. And I've shown you enough examples for that. The close follow-up by a pediatric nephrologist is mandatory in every PUV child. In fact, every child that we see in with PUV is always managed in conjunction with a nephrologist. Bladder evaluation should be thorough before a renal transplant because most of these children, for instance, the example I showed you, it's a live donor transplant and you're putting two people at risk if you don't do your job thoroughly. So this concludes the, the PUV part of the talk. And I'm now going into the second part of the talk, which is robotic surgery in uh, CACUT. We have done 325 robotic procedures in children in a 10-year period. The smallest baby we have done is four kgs in weight and two months old. The majority of procedures are pyeloplasties for PUJ obstructions. Reimplants for VUR are the next. The other important procedures in CACUT include heminephrectomies and an appendix metrophenoff. I'll just show you three of these procedures in order to give you an idea. Here is an example. This is, this is an infant who is undergoing a robotic pyeloplasty. That's your, that's your left kidney that the kidney has been exposed. We're picking up the pelvis. We are creating a space between the ureter and the renal pelvis. You can see the PUJ with the kink in the ureter. We take a stitch in the pelvis and, and, then, and then we dismember the PUJ. We get a fixed point around which we can work. Now that you have detached the ureter, now you spatulate the ureter. And you can see how the ureter, after it is spatulated, you can see the narrow segment and the wide ureter below. Now we take a, a stitch between the ureter and the pelvis at its most dependent position and anchor the pelvis and the ureter together. Then we finish the posterior wall anastomosis. Remove the excess of the ureter and the pelvis. Start the first suture on the anterior wall. Put a stent into the bladder. Finish the anterior wall anastomosis and close the pelvis. Here we are using a 5-0 vicryl and that's your completed anastomosis. So these are the sort of scars that you would get after a robotic pyeloplasty. We put four ports, camera at the umbilicus, two ports in the midline and an assistant port here and you compare it to a pyeloplasty scar, which is open. That's an infant who's positioned for a left-sided pyeloplasty. So now what, over the years, we offer both open and robotic, and we find that there is an increasing preference among the patients to choose for robotic. The metrics and the outcomes, the average time for the procedure is 60 minutes. Since we are a teaching institution, the fellows also get involved in doing the procedure. We discharge them in two days and remove the stent after six to eight weeks. Our success rate is 98.6% and we have a 1.4% clavian dindo type 3 complication. This is ureteric reimplant. This is the other common procedure that we do. I just wanted to give you an example of a single kidney with a scar with the VUR on a DRC, a direct radionuclide cystogram. And this is how we would go about doing an extravesical ureteric reimplant. We hitch the bladder to expose and put the vesicuretric junction on stretch. We identify the ureter at the pelvic brim, tape it for atraumatic handling. You can see the ureteric blood supply is preserved. We go to the base of the bladder, expose the VUJ and mark a detrusor tunnel. Once we mark the tunnel, 
Then we create a submucosal uh, tunnel, allow the mucosa to bulge, place the ureter within the tunnel and suture the detrusor over the ureter. This involves a back and forth passing of the needle from one side to the other. And once that is done, then you find that the ureter is within the tunnel. We make sure we are not strangulating the ureter. There is enough space around it. That is your tunnel. And you can see peristalsis going across. It takes about 45 minutes to do it. We don't put a stent. So, if it's an obstructed mega ureter where we have a segment that is aperistaltic, what do we do? Here is an example. We detach the ureter from the bladder. We excise the obstructed segment. And then we reattach the ureter to the bladder. In this particular case, we always put a DJ stent in place. That's the anterior wall anastomosis has been completed. Then we have reimplanted the ureter. You can see the tunnel and you can see the ureteral peristalsis going across the anastomosis. So we have, these are the scars of the robotic reimplant. This is the open reimplant scar. This is your robotic reimplant scar. It's a little placed a little high up. That's one. There's one more scar there and within the, within the uh, umbilical cicatrix. We have done about 43 cases. Our success is about 87%. It's a little less than open. We are aware of that, but I'm sure with more cases, we'll become better. We take about 45 minutes. In a normal reimplant, no, no stent, so we can discharge them within two days. Whenever the ureter is detached or is tapered, then we put a stent. I'm going to show you a, a three-minute video of a robotic Mitrofenov. I feel robotics is ideal for both Mitrofenov and for uh, augmentation cystoplasty. So that's the appendix. The first thing we do is we try and assess the appendix. It has to be at least six centimeters in length. It has to have a robust blood supply. We make sure it can reach the abdominal wall easily. We take a stitch at the tip to handle the tip. Then we make an opening at the base where the cecum and the appendix are together. Then we tie the base of the appendix. Sometimes we can even borrow some mucosa from the cecum in order to extend the appendix. Then we detach the appendix from the cecum. And we take a stitch at the open end of the appendix so that now we have the appendix held at both ends. This is a neurogenic bladder. So what we do is we drop the bladder from the anterior abdominal wall. Here is the bladder being dropped from the anterior abdominal wall. We decide where we want to do the uh, robotic Mitrofenov. We decide the angle at which the appendix will come. And then like what we would do, we stretch the appendix to see if it will fit. And like what we do in a reimplant, we incise the detrusor and create a submucosal tunnel. Now we measure it also. We make sure we have at least a four centimeter tunnel. I'll tell you the reason for this. Then we place the appendix within the tunnel. We anchor the detrusor and the appendix first so that the appendix stays in place. Here we are using a PDS suture. The tip of the appendix is, is cut. The end is spatulated. Then we make an opening in the mucosa of the bladder. Then we start a full thickness anastomosis of the appendix to the mucosa of the bladder. That's one wall being completed. Then we catheterize with the feeding tube. And with the feeding tube in place, we suture the other wall. Now the appendicovesicostomy is complete. Now what we do is we suture the detrusor over the appendix. The reason is 
when the bladder is full, we don't want urine leaking on the abdominal wall through the appendicular stoma. So this is very important to create a good wrap of the appendix. This is the reason for the detrusor tunnel. And so here we are creating a, a, a good wrap of the appendix, around, of the detrusor around the appendix. And here is the procedure completed. We are freeing the blood supply at the tip of the appendix so that it can come out onto the abdominal wall easily. We decide where it should come out. And the assistant pulls out the appendix. And now you can see the appendix from the abdominal wall into the bladder with a good blood supply. This and augmentation cystoplasty in robotics are really useful. So this has been our experience in, in robotics. We have, done, we have done quite a lot of procedures. Almost any type of procedure, any variation, we would have, we would have done it. And uh, including tumors, though we haven't got into Wilms tumors as yet. So in conclusion, robotic surgery in Kakut, robotic surgery provides excellent and durable outcomes in all types of reconstructive procedures in children. It does that because it provides an outstanding 3D vision. You saw that and also enables suturing in tiny spaces. The most enduring feature of robotic surgery, in my opinion, is the very early return to feeding. You do a pyeloplasty in the morning, by the afternoon they are feeding and they are also, they can move within the next day. And robotic surgery is something that can be easily taught to the next generation and you can easily get the next generation involved. So Dr. Kalevani, Dr. Sudha, Dr. Namalwar, and the chairperson, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk. And I hope I have done some justice to the topic that's been allotted to me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing your rich experience. And it was an excellent uh, talk. And uh, we have a few questions for you. But before Please. that, I have a question, sir. So yeah. you spoke about the anticholinergics and the uh, beta blockers. So I just want to know the upcoming one, which is the Merabegron. Yeah. Uh, so what is your stand on it and uh, its use in uh, children? Sir? Yeah, I, I'm always scared to talk about pharmacotherapeutics to, in the presence of such a learned audience. But uh, the fact of the matter is we are slowly switching over to, uh, to Mira Begron. Um, the only problem with Mira Begron, and you can sort of, you know, sort of, you know, give me some uh, you know, pointers on that. I find it's very hard to titrate the dose, especially in small children. But Mira Begron is our preferred way of going rather than uh, oxybutynin. Uh, what we would do is suppose, I, I'll put it across like this. Suppose we wanted very good control of, uh, of detrusor overactivity. We would start on oxybutynin two, two times a day or even three times a day. If it's an older child, we'll put them on tolterodine. But if possible, we will always give them Mira Begron. The only problem is I haven't done, given the volume of work, I haven't done a great follow-up study on how effective Mira Begron is. I think Ramesh Babu of Ramchandra has done a study which he's published. But I think Mira Begron is the way to go. And uh, there are a uh, few questions in the chat box. Just, sure. Uh, without, sure. Uh, how many of your patients who underwent primary fulguration turned to CKD in the long-term follow-up? Uh, very good yeah. question. A uh, very good question. I want the person who's asking this question to join my unit and look at the look at all the data I have. I really, you know, the problem is we are working like nobody's business and we don't have the time. That's a very good question. I would say a ballpark figure. And I want Namalwar, sir, sir Namalwar, sir's opinion on this. I would say a ballpark figure is anywhere between 15 to 25% is what I feel. But again, the issue of making any broad statements on this is not valid, primarily because we might be seeing a very specific subset. It might be just the bad ones that are coming to us. We get a lot of people for video urodynamics. And, you know, most of them have high creatinine values. Therefore, my question is, are we sub-selecting those that are bad? Our own ones that we have fulgurated and we have followed up, we just have used the rule of if the nadir creatinine is about 0.8 or less within the first year of life, generally they do well. But I really haven't done a longitudinal follow-up study on this. But my answer to that question will be a ballpark figure of anywhere between 15 to 25%. Yes, sir. as you said, it's really difficult. Namalwar, sir, your stand on it, sir. No, I do agree with Dr. Shepati. The thing is, we, we do not have a complete follow-up for all our children. We lose them to some time. But the fact is, from guests, as a guest, I mean, I can guess, 
nearly about 20 to 30 percent of a patient do go into some form of CK. It's not that they go to the terminal renal failure, they go to some part of renal failure, then they pull on for years. But what happens is after adulthood, we lose them. After 18 years, we do not know what happens to them. So up to 19, up to 18, I think a guess will be about 30 percent of our children do have CKD in different grades. That's how we must approach it. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, the subsequent question is about alpha blocker, which says cover. Uh, so, so how soon do you do a first UDS for PUV babies? Correct. See, this is this is a question in which I've had uh, innumerable fights all over uh, wherever I go to the US. I've sort of you know given a lot of talks all over the place from Stanford to New York. I don't think you really in our country remember UDS costs money. And uh, at the end of the day, the parents want to know what you have achieved by doing UDS. See, you know the you you know the type of patients that we are dealing with, and what I'm talking about here. When uh, you know money is at a premium, we can't afford to have a rigid protocol which says do a UDS in the newborn period again at one year, again at two years, again at three years. No, what I would do is suppose I follow up a patient and I find that the kidneys are not growing well, or I find there is increasing ureteral dilatation. There is an increasing post void, recurrent urinary tract infection, a sudden onset of you know a rise in serum creatinine, which can't be explained. Those would be the triggers for me to do a urodynamic study, rather than right off saying everybody gets a urodynamic study. If suppose suppose you know suppose we have a ch child under our joint care and the child is doing very well, I wouldn't do urodynamics on the child at all. I may be wrong when I'm saying this. But, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think you have to stitch your, uh, you know, you have to cut your uh, coat according to the cloth you have rather than uh, going in a very rigid fashion with, remember, urodynamics also can be highly misleading. It's not as if urodynamics, like for instance, I, I mean, I was just in Chicago where they were doing a, a urodynamic uh, in-service, uh, you know, meeting. And, uh, you know, uh, the consultant involvement in the actual urodynamics is not present. I'm sorry to say this. I saw this in Australia, in Princess Margaret. I'm seeing it elsewhere also. If you are not involved, if the person who is most knowledgeable is not involved in the urodynamics, the urodynamics is not worth the paper it's written on. I know I'm, I, I, again, I'm, I'm taking Dr. Namalva's permission to quote my age. I'm saying I'm old. I don't care what people say. If they say I'm talking out of my hat, that's fine. But I think the consultant involvement in urodynamics is so important. Whether you increase the rate of infusion, whether you decrease, whether you want to, you know, you want a, a, a Valsalva, um, you know, a, a Valsalva leak point pressure to assess when the actual leak point pressure is happening. When would you stop the infusion? When would you assess the child is showing signs of bladder fullness? There are so many factors. And to actually relegate to, to somebody to do it and generate a report, I think is a, is a, is a travesty. So uh, I think, you know, you, uh, the, the short answer to that question is in, in my own experience, what I would do is if I have one of those triggers I mentioned, I would definitely go in for urodynamics, but I would not do it routinely for everybody in a rigid protocol based fashion. I wouldn't. But I have a small question. Yes, in, yes, in case, yes, uh, so, because the urodynamics needs so much of uh, efforts or so much of... Uh, yes, uh, sir, yes, yes. Follow up, etc. What about the Euroflow studies? Absolutely, they, they, sir. They, they, they practice. Absolutely, sir. I strongly feel Euroflow should be there in the in everybody's room, sir. And uh, that's what we do. We just ask them to do a Euroflow and show us the report. And we take uh, the the other problem with Euroflow, sir. Today is we must have an ultrasound also attached to it because we need to know the pre void uh, volume and the post void residue. For us, we are, uh, you know, because of the uh, the draconian nature of our uh, of the rules with regard to ultrasound usage in our country, it becomes very difficult for us to have an ultrasound attached to us. So what we have is what is called a Labori Porta scan. The Porta scan is a portable scanner with which we look at bladder volumes before, see how much volume is being held. And after the study, we check how much volume is again being held. So that I think I would completely agree with you, sir. Euroflow is the simplest thing that can be done. And most of the time, the Euroflow will negate the need for formal Eurodynamics. Absolutely. Completely agree with you, sir. Uh, there's a next uh, question. It's quite long. So um, uh, he says, uh, one of the attendees says that uh, he starts on routine anticholinergics, alpha blockers, and prophylaxis simultaneously and means them. 
uh, of the anticholinergics and the alpha blockers within six months period when the post void residue goes down. And he keeps following them uh, with the ultrasound. And so far, he's not got the need to do it. Uh, so he just wants to know that uh, is this uh, the right way or the, should I change the practice and not start yeah. them routinely on both the medications, despite yeah. the bladder wall taken in. Absolutely. In fact, funnily enough, I came across this uh, practice in uh, Tanjavur. Um, a lot of referrals from down south, they would start on something called PAMCONTIN. It's both an anticholinergics and tamsulosin. And you know, the problem is that once you start them on drugs like this, you don't know what is causing what. At the end of the day, you don't know what to do about it. I think I would, my today what I would do is I would never start anybody on anticholinergics unless they actually have a need for it. Because somewhere along the line, Sudha, all of us are aware that what we talk of as PUV slowly blends into a dysfunctional voider when the child is in school, you know, holding urine, not passing stool. So where does PUV start? Where does dysfunctional voiding end? I don't know. I don't know the answer to it. And when we are adding anticholinergics to it, imagine an, imagine an adolescent boy who's used to holding urine in school and he is a PUV with the poorly functioning kidney on one side and you start him on anticholinergics and he comes back with a big bladder. What do you do at the end of the day? And then the concept, you know, though a lot of people are, are of the opinion that you can start both anticholinergics and alpha blockers at the same time, we also do that off and on. Sometimes it's sort of, you know, I, I get a little confused with it. Having said that, I think it is very good to have very clear indications. Like I would say, to summarize it, if, you're, if you want to start somebody on anticholinergics, please do a urodynamic study on them. If you find, for instance, you have, a, if, if you do a Euroflow on them, you find a very high peak flow, what is called a super wider with no post void residue, severe symptoms of urgency, start them on, start them on anticholinergics. Please remember, treat the constipation at the same time. Suppose it's most PUV children have poor Euroflows. Suppose you have a poor Euroflow, a large post void residue, start them on alpha blockers, but ask them to come back in three months, six months time. See whether your alpha blockers have made a difference. Don't endlessly put them on the drugs. Forget about them. Because then you will reach a situation where you won't know where you are. That's what will happen finally. So, and I think uh, BBD is uh, taking a major role nowadays. Absolutely. UTI or PUV. And uh, the post void residue is just not because of the bladder. Such, I mean, it's because of the BBD. And I think we need to treat that first, then directly... Absolutely. Very well put. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the excellent uh, session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very class. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks Pleasure. for joining. It was an amazing talk, sir, with a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. Thanks, thank Kalevani. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's our pleasure, sir. So, Kalevani, shall we move on to the next uh, talk? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And can I have the CV slide of uh, yeah. Ma'am's speech? So, the next speaker for today is uh, Dr. Pratima Radhakrishnan. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pratima. And uh, she's the director and consultant in fetal medicine, Bangalore Fetal Medicine Center. And she has special interest in fetal therapy, early diagnosis of fetal abnormalities, and pre-pregnancy counseling for fetal anomalies. And uh, she's the first Indian to get a diploma in uh, fetal medicine from the United Kingdom, and also the first Indian to perform the therapeutic fetoscopic laser treatment for complicated monochorionic twins. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Pratima. And uh, she's here to uh, deliver her and enlighten us on the prenatal aspects uh, of CACUT. Over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, you're not audible. Uh, thank you very much, yeah. uh, Dr. Sudha. And thank you uh, very much, Dr. Kalevani. And thanks all of you for accommodating my, uh, you know, bit of a time mismanagement today. I'm really, my apologies for that. And thanks, Dr. Sripati, for filling in uh, before me. Uh, if I can be allowed to share my screen. Yeah, that will be great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, how much time do I have? Ma'am, you have uh, 30 minutes. 30. Kalei, am I right? Uh, can you see my slideshow? Yeah, it's visible and you're audible. 
Okay. Uh, not my presenter's view, but my slideshow. Yeah, it's slideshow. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, do uh, remind me about two minutes before so I can just move on because Kalei, Dr. Kalei told me to put a lot of cases. So I have done a lot of cases and put in a lot of ultrasound images. Uh, you know, sure, sure. I'll, I'll so, time you out. Uh, you know, I can skip it if uh, I'm running late. Because once sure, I, I'll time you. I yeah, yeah. Look at the time. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, okay, so uh, let us straight jump into uh, the prenatal aspects of the CACUT because uh, I know most of you, uh, or almost all of you, are the ones who are dealing with the postnatal aspect and looking at uh, what. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a, a little insight as to what uh, we do in our realm to be able and, and need, of course, a lot of your help, both antenatally and postnatally. Now, renal, uh, renal tract anomalies are uh, one of the most common anomalies that we see in the prenatal period, and many of them can coexist with other abnormalities as well. Now, it is very important, as we know, that we need to detect these early because in the very bad cases, it allows us uh, termination of pregnancy. It can modify the obstetric practice and, of course, very, very importantly, facilitate the pediatric and surgical care of the newborn infant. And a lot of parents are now seeking help from the uh, nephrologists and the pediatric urologists uh, you know, antenatally itself, and this is what we try to encourage them to do as well. Now, the CACUT types could be the parenchymal malformations, renal ectopia fusion, collection system anomalies, but to be very honest, antenatally, we don't really divide them into these kind of groups. We just look at the kidneys and we just kind of describe the findings that we have. Many times it fits into a diagnosis, sometimes it doesn't fit into a diagnosis, and I will take you through a few case examples, uh, the more recent ones, because as I said, you know, we do have a lot of renal anomalies that uh, we do see. Now, Look, first, the normals. We can see the kidney, the urinary tract system right from the first trimester itself. And um, if you can see my laser pointer, this is a 11, 12 week scan, the first trimester scan, where you can see the bladder from right from 11 to 12 weeks onwards itself. And we do document the presence of uh, a bladder. And on transvaginal scan, particularly at 11, 12 weeks itself, we can start seeing the kidneys, we can start, start seeing the renal arteries. And so therefore, the documentation of at least one functioning kidney can happen as early as uh, 12 weeks. And of course, at the uh, anomaly scan and in the third trimester, it's extremely important to document the normalcy of the kidneys and of course, the presence of the bladder as well. Now, the other very important thing uh, antenatally is to uh, assess the uh, lung, uh, assess the amniotic fluid. And prior to uh, 20 weeks, the kidneys do not really contribute that much to the uh, am uh, amniotic fluid. Therefore, primarily it's after 20 weeks that uh, the amniotic fluid or maybe after 18 weeks that amniotic fluid becomes a surrogate marker for renal function. Now, uh, the other thing that uh, people have done is assess the uh, am uh, amniotic fluid for the uh, for sodium beta to microglobulin. Uh, sorry, um, my mistake. Beta to microglobulin and urine or small elite. and of course amniocentesis to assess for the uh, chromosomal and genetic abnormalities. Now let us go trimester wise. So let us look at the first trimester uh, abnormalities that we uh, see in the. Uh, in the urinary tract system. And this is important to all of you because many times these kids, uh, these parents will end up with uh, you to uh, counsel them about what is coming up. Now, this is a huge black space in the uh, pelvis in about 12, 13 weeks, uh, 13 week uh, fetus. And this is, you know, a bladder unless proved otherwise. And it is, of course, a metacystis. Metacystis is one of the most easily detectable abnormality in the first trimester. And you can see the huge big bladder there. And this is the umbilical vessels, uh, the, the, uh, the umbilical arteries, which abet the uh, bladder. And uh, this is then again easily detectable in the first trimester. So this is classically uh, urinary tract, uh, lower urinary tract obstruction. And this is what the you know, blood proposes. And this is that was bilaterally hydronephrosis in this pregnancy as well. Now, let us look at another example here, again, of, uh, you know, metacystis. 
huge big bladder, very difficult to miss it. In addition, this baby had ventricular megaly and abnormal leptus venosus uh, waveform as well. Why this is moving so fast like that? Okay. In addition, this baby had other abnormalities uh, like ventricular megaly and abnormal uh, ductus venosus waveform, and therefore uh, we did a uh, you know chromosomal analysis, and it was a normal candidate. Now there are parents sometimes who will not want to discontinue in the first uh, look itself. They want to kind of give the baby a chance, and they, uh, you know the see whether. Uh, we can wait and see whether uh, whether we can give this baby a chance as well. Now, although this baby had multiple anomalies, uh, the couple decided that because there was a uh, you know the, the, because there was the karyotype was normal, could we do something else to try and see if we can salvage this baby? And at that point of time, we have really not much other than do a psychosynthesis. So we did have a psychosynthesis a couple of times because the first was psychosynthesis does not feel much. So the second follow-up, again, we saw continuously the blood size was increasing. We checked the unit and sodium and uh, but as, uh, sodium and chloride and beta 2 microglobulin, which was significantly high. And at the, by this point, parents also were a little bit more convinced that uh, this doesn't look good, and therefore we need to terminate the pregnancy. So sometimes, you know, waiting a little bit, uh, you know, the, the parents prefer that they want to prove that there was indeed an abnormality and not just by scanning. So uh, most of these ones, unfortunately, do pretty badly uh, in the first place. Now, uh, here is another example of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a baby that was referred to as metacystis. Of course, there was metacystis, as you can see, big bladder, and there was a single umbilical artery as well. But in addition, this baby had another abnormality, and as you can see, that both the lower limbs were completely, both the lower limbs were fused, were joined together. So this is actually a synomelia. So what I'm trying to tell is the same metacystis can present in so many different forms and different uh, uh, along with other abnormalities as well. So it is very important that if you see a report with metacystis, it's not just the metacystis, you need to look out for other things as well. So that the report must be comprehensive, giving you the information of all the other abnormalities also. Now, this is another uh, again, uh, example of metacystis, but here the bladder size is only about nine millimeters. Now, this is Another group of metacystis, which is not necessarily uh, that bad as what we saw before. Now, why this happens is because in some uh, megacystis is divided into two parts. One megacystis where between seven to 15 millimeters and many of them, about one third of them can be associated with aneuploidies. But once you exclude the possibility of an aneuploidy, then majority of them will resolve. So in this group of babies, if there are no other abnormalities, structural or chromosomal or genetic, we would tend to wait and see, and many of them will resolve by 20 weeks. However, in the other group, where it is an obstructive type, where it is more than 16 millimeters, although 10% can be associated with aneuploidies, majority of them are due to obstructive uropathy, and therefore, these have got a much poorer prognosis, either a posterior urethral valve or urethral atresia, which is even worse. Now, megacystis, as we can see, is one of the abnormalities that can always be detected in the first trimester. That is what we call as a target nine. Now, let us look at something else in the first trimester. Now, this baby, uh, this is a consanguineous couple and was referred to us with a uh, encephalocy, that is a breach in the cranium. And because of that, the brain was protruding outside. Okay, so you can see the uh, brain protruding outside here. Now, in addition, this baby also had a uh, bilateral. Uh, so let me just uh, move the video forward for you. Okay, in addition, this baby also had uh, bilateral enlarged echogenic kidneys. Okay, there you go. So that is the bilateral enlarged echogenic kidneys, and there was polydactyly in all limbs as well. So classic, clearly, this is a genetic syndrome. It's called Meckel-Gruber syndrome, and this is an autosomal recessive condition, and uh, the recurrence risk is about 25%. So if we see an obstetrical encephalopathy, or many times bilateral enlarged 
uh, polycystic uh, kidneys in the first trimester or even sometimes in the second trimester, unfortunately, because uh, they, you know, uh, first trimester, sometimes it can be missed. It should not be missed, but it can be missed. Uh, and in those situations, we must think about possibility of Michael Cooper syndrome, right? Now, the, there are a lot, lot of genetic abnormalities which can be associated with uh, renal anomalies and renal tubular dysgenesis, which is an early onset oligoamnios, which is present, and then ossification defects can be present in the important sequence. Renal cystic disease, again, autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant, and of course, no, nephronolithesis, which is an autosomal recessive kind of mutation, and several gene mutations in combination of genetic mutations have been reported with renal anomalies in the first trimester and, of course, in the second trimester also. Now, let us look at some abnormalities in the second and third trimester. Now, the most common abnormality is renal hydro, sorry, fetal hydronephrosis. And there, there is a renal pelvic dilatation with or without the dilatation of renal calvices, calysis. And majority of the times, these are transient. However, there has been grading that has happened, uh, 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 grading of the uh, fetal hydronephrosis by the Society of uh, Fetal Urology and UTD classification. But to be honest, there is no consensus in what we should be following prenatally. However, what is uh, shown is when the renal pelvic dilatation exceeds 10 millimeters, particularly in the third trimester, there's a much higher risk of, uh, you know, renal anomalies, uh, renal problems postnatally as well. Now, let us look at some of these classification. The, the renal pelvic dilatation, which is the most frequently uh, used uh, uh, classification, which we use antenatally. And we look at the uh, renal pelvis in the AP diameter. And <clears throat> if it's more than 10 in uh, second trimester and more than 15 in the uh, third trimester, this increases the risk for uh, cacut, as I said. Now, mild renal pelvic dilatation, which is defined as between 4 to 10 millimeters, majority of them will resolve. However, we do follow them up antenatally, and I will show you a few examples. And uh, But also mild renal pelvic dilatation can be marker for chromosomal abnormalities, particularly uh, uh, for uh, Down syndrome uh, as well. Now, there are the Society of PT Neurology and uh, have given a grading system which includes the not only the renal pelvic dilatation, uh, the degree and site, but also it looks at the number of calyces that is involved and, of course, the uh, parenchymal uh, atrophy as well. However, they do not include the bladder and ureter. On the other hand, the UPD, UTD, sorry, UTD classification, which looks at the uh, renal pelvic dilatation and in addition to the uh, pelvic calyces, uh, again, the uh, and, and the management is based on this. But as I said, we mostly use the renal pelvic dilatation of uh, more than 5 millimeters, which is the Fetal Medicine Foundation guideline at 18 to 24 weeks. Now, what we follow is pretty much uh, this. Uh, if it is a bilateral, if it's unilateral or bilateral, if it's not bilateral, then of course, we just repeat the ultrasound at uh, in the third trimester. And at that time, if it is more than 10, uh, uh, if it's less, sorry, if it's less than 10, uh, it uh, it resolves. That means it is resolved and there's not much need for follow-up. However, if it is more than 10, then it requires follow-up in the postnatal period. Now, if there is bilateral, then we look at the amniotic fluid. If there is oligoamnios, then the prognosis is likely to be guarded. However, if there is no, uh, no oligoamnios, then we follow them up regularly looking for oligoamnios and of course the renal pelvic dilatation. If it exceeds 10 millimeters, then the prognosis would be affected and it will require much more uh, follow-up. Or if there is development of oligoamniosis, oligohydramnios, significant oligohydramnios, not little bit of oligoamnios because there are many other reasons for oligohydramnios as well. Now, if the renal pelvic dilatation is more than 10 millimeters in the third trimester, then of course we, uh, you know, strongly suggest for postnatal evaluation. So now let us go through a few more examples. Now this is a baby which was referred to us uh, because of a keyhole bladder at, uh, so yeah, a keyhole bladder at the uh, 20, uh, it was 22 weeks. The first trimester scan was reported normal. And of course, there was significant, uh, you know, uh, severe renal pelvic 
very still connotation. Of course, there was a large bladder as well, right? So that's the uh, kidney, and you can see the hugely dilated uh, pelvic cell system on both sides. There's a bilateral. If I can just move the yeah, and there was a huge bladder. Okay, sorry, I touched the video. It goes, it goes funny. That's a huge bladder, right? And this cortex is also uptrend down here, and you can see there is a stretching of the bladder there right up to that point, and that is what we call as a megalourethra. So there was a severe renal disease here, and uh, this. Uh, however, the interesting part was the amniotic fluid, although there was only one amniotic, it was just reduced, right? In addition, there was urinary dilatation as well. So we did offer them amniocentesis and mesocentesis. Uh, uh, Pratima, ma'am, uh, sorry to intervene. Can no. you stay a little closer to the mic because the voice oh. is not all that clear? All right. Okay. So yeah. what, I'll just switch off my video because sometimes I can interrupt uh, there. Okay, so is that clearer? Much better, ma'am. Much better. Okay, yeah. Okay, so in this situation, uh, we thought probably there was a lower uh, urinary tract obstruction, but it was intermittent because at 22 weeks, we have expected if there was no outflow uh, from the uh, bladder at all, then you should have an hydrogenous there. Okay, now uh, this is another case to refer to as with severe. Uh, you know, bilateral renal pelvic uh, dilatation. In addition, there was a urethric dilatation, there was thinned out cortices as well. However, the bladder and the, uh, uh, sorry, is this a repeat, repeated one? The bladder and the amniotic fluid was normal in this case. Sorry, this was, yes, right. Now, in this particular case, what happened was, this was also an intermittent root too, but what was interesting here was over a period of time, over a period of time, the amniotic fluid dropped, which was initially all right. At 30 to 33 weeks, the amniotic fluid dropped, and she was then delivered at uh, 34 uh, weeks, and she delivered a baby uh, girl, 1.7 uh, kilo. Uh, sorry, it was 1.7 kilos. Okay. Now, postnatally, this baby, please ignore this 2.9. It is. Uh, Sorry, 1.7 was the amniotic fluid. My, my apologies. 1.7 was the amniotic fluid and 2.9 kg was the baby girl which was born at 34 weeks. And uh, the baby was not passing urine. Surgery was done and uh, bilaterally the PC, PC and lines were kept and renogram done and uh, you know she's under follow-up with the pediatric surgeons now. Okay. Okay, sorry. Now, another case with uh, severe hydronephrosis, bilateral hydronephrosis, and in this particular case, they, uh, you know, the kidneys were enlarged as well. The ureters were dilated. There was a keyhole, and this one was referred to as almost at 29 weeks, as you can see, right? This patient was referred to as at 29 weeks, and by the time, there was quite a significant amount of uh, blockage, and uh, there was anhydramnios, and... Uh, the you know because of the anhydramnios and the condition the baby was delivered at uh, 30 weeks a 1.4 kg uh, baby unfortunately for this one we do not have a, a postnatal confirmation uh, because you know we couldn't reach out to the parents uh, because sometimes the parents give us a lot of history and tell us what's going on but sometimes they don't uh, they don't want to take, just, uh, tell us everything Okay, so here we could not get the postnatal confirmation, but you know, prenatally also it looks bad, and of course, there's a premature baby with uh, you know, very, uh, with a low birth weight, also. Now, this is another uh, case of uh, case which was referred to us with echogenic kidneys, real pelvic dilatation, and there was uh, polyhydramnios as well. Now, there was indeed bilateral real pelvic dilatation, which was not significant 5.5 and 5.3, but. Uh, what was interesting was that she had calicial dilatation and uh, this baby also had uretary dilatation. Now, this uh, baby uh, was delivered at term and uh, she's under the follow-up uh, with the pediatric surgeons and this was confirmed to be bilateral VUJ obstruction uh, after uh, 
birth, of course. Right. So this kid is now, I think, nearly about two, three years old and doing okay so far, although she does have uh, some uh, urinary infections, which is not surprising. Again, as you can see, the bladder was all right and the amniotic fluid around the baby was okay. Now, uh, we did a little follow up of our babies, uh, which were detected to have a renal pelvic dilatation, and we just see, uh, divided them into various groups of 4 to 4.9, 5, 6, 7, 8, to see which are the ones which actually uh, require to go undergo uh, you know, postnatal surgery and follow up, etc. We had about 16,000 uh, singleton pregnancies of which 70 unemployed and 1,421 fetuses with non renal structural anomalies, which were excluded. Of the 786 fetuses, we had uh, follow-ups in uh, 276 and out of which, uh, sorry, about uh, 276 were uh, in, in this group, 74 in the 5 to 5.9, 6 to 6.9. And uh, what we noticed was as the antenatal RPD increased, the chances of finding progressive renal disease also increased, right? And the need for surgery was more likely in the group, which was more than uh, seven millimeters. And of course, bilateral was more common, uh, commonly associated with progressive disease than the uh, uh, than the unilateral uh, disease as well. Now, looking at some more abnormalities, uh, looking at the echogenicity of the kidney. Now, echogenicity of the kidneys, you can, uh, this one was referred to as at 26 weeks with bilateral echogenic kidneys. Now, yes, the kidneys looked very pretty. They were bilaterally echogenic, but they were normal in size. And in addition, they had normal amniotic fluid. So we just labeled this as uh, echogenic kidneys and uh, carried on the uh, uh, pregnancy and they came for further follow up uh, at uh, uh, 20, uh, 28 and 31 weeks. So, this was at 31 weeks. Again, it continued to be normal size for that gestational age. There was normal bladder and normal amniotic fluid. So, we really could not define what exactly, uh, why exactly this baby was shown, continued to show us these, uh, you know, echogenic kidneys uh, with normal renal function, what we see antenatally with, uh, I understand that the surrogate markers with bladder and the uh, amniotic fluid. Now, I just spoke to this couple just today only, and uh, he told me that the postnatally the baby was found to have a uh, genetic condition, uh, and he could not tell me exactly the mutation, but they have had a genetic testing, and they are under the pediatric nephrologist care, two years old now, uh, had, you know, the it, the, it, it, the baby is on uh, antihypertensive and uh, under the nephrology care, doing so far okay. But what he told me was the baby has got CKD3A, so which concerned me a bit. Uh, so which I'm sure you know uh, will will at some point of time I would assume that uh, the baby will require uh, a transplant. But again, uh, you know one echogenic kidney which completely resolved. And one set of echogenic kidney, which went on into a genetic uh, condition. We had offered them the uh, invasive testing at the uh, 20 weeks when we had seen them, but at that point of time, they did not want. But now, of course, the, now that they have found a mutation in this thing, uh, what I could tell the parents was the parents need to have a genetic evaluation as well, not, uh, so that the parents will need uh, genetic testing and then the next pregnancy, of course, because he was interested in next pregnancy with me. Uh, and when I told him that, uh, you know, they need to be evaluated and uh, to, to be tested for the same genes. And in the subsequent pregnancy, we can offer them uh, CVS at, uh, 12, uh, at 12, 13 weeks and check for the same genetic condition in the subsequent pregnancies. So at least there is some hope for the future. Now, this is another pregnancy first. Trimester, second trimester, normal anomalies. And she was married to her maternal uncle. And at 24 weeks, she was referred to us with severe bilateral uh, kidneys. Now, 24 weeks, there was only uh, echogenic kidneys. But at 28 weeks, what we, when we came, brought her back for the follow-up, what we also saw was uh, ascites 
and uh, you know uh, 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 a, a site is as well. However, yes, sorry, we had done a amniocentesis at 24 weeks, and uh, that showed uh, no uh, the microarray was normal. However, there were lots of areas of homozygosity, which is not an uncommon finding in uh, these uh, in, in the couple who are married constantly. Now, at 28 weeks on the follow-up, this couple decided to continue the pregnancy. At 28 weeks, we saw bilateral uveitus leak as well and ascites, and uh, you know they did, and in addition there was prominent bowel groups. So there were multiple abnormalities as the pregnancy advanced and uh, multiple involvements of the other system. And uh, unfortunately, this baby died. Uh, unfortunately, the baby died uh, on the second uh, day after uh, second day after. So this was all. This is also a genetic renal disease. So we have stored the DNA because we do have that option of storing the DNA in the laboratory, and that will require further evaluation as well. Now this is another uh, baby that was referred to uh, that she had a routine anomaly scan. Sorry, the first trimester and the second trimester scans were us, and again we saw these very pretty looking kidneys, uh, and uh, there was normal. Uh, re, uh, Renal pelvises, there was no renal pelvic dilatation per se, but then you saw a little bit of pelvial dilatation there. So we would still call it hydronephrosis. And the follow up at the follow up scans at 28, 31, and 33 weeks, there was no mention about the kidneys, kidneys being completely normal. So this was very transient finding, and uh, the baby was just born with mild fetal growth restriction, which kind of, uh, you know. Uh, the baby had no renal uh, abnormalities. I spoke to this mother today, and she said the baby is doing fine at five months of age. Right. Again, to Pratima, uh, sorry to disturb you. We have another three more minutes. Yes, great. Okay, so I'm I'm almost in the last three four slides. Right. So this is a multicystic dysplastic uh, kidney, and as you all know, the unilateral multicystic dysplastic kidney, we do encourage them to continue this pregnancy, particularly the contralateral kidney and the bladder here normal. And of course, this, this you know, very motivated couple continue the pregnancy and delivered a live baby uh, girl, who she does have some urinary tract infections, but overall she's doing well. Uh, and uh, they are under the follow-up uh, of the pediatric urologist as well. Now, uh, another uh, first trimester scan uh, was normal. Second trimester, she was referred to as a non visualization of one kidney. And when we actually looked at the uh, other kidney, there was fused cross ectopia. So, both the other kidney was, uh, you know, uh, sitting behind the uh, right, uh, beside the right kidney, and it was uh, fused as well. So, this is a fused uh, uh, renal ectopia. So, if you don't find the kidney in its usual place and the bladder and the amniotic fluid is normal, then you look at other places, and uh, of course, there are many, many, many more abnormalities that I could show you. But for the want of time, we will just get on with antenatal uh, management of catholics. And what is extremely important, it's counseling of the families. And what we look up to you is to counsel the couples antenatally based on the experiences that you have had. And of course, uh, generally, there are poor prognostic factors that usually don't reach you also, because remember, the best of the cases reach you because majority of the bilateral renal diseases, bilateral renal agenesis, uh, severe oligoamnios, unfavorable amniotic, uh, amniotic uh, fluid analysis. And of course, when there's a legal term, uh, limit of termination, these probably terminate much early and you don't see the worst end of the spectrum. However, we also uh, like to know about the outcomes of these pregnancies. And uh, as we said, as I showed you some examples, some of them can be detected with genetic abnormalities after the child is born because not everybody agrees to uh, doing genetic testing, particularly when there is an isolated renal abnormality with uh, otherwise everything else looking reasonably good. So sometimes these things can be deceptive and uh, you know the couple need to be told that there is a background of a genetic possibility. Also, because not all autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, we will be able to pick up uh, antenatally also. Now, uh, there are, of course, in utero interventions, but many of them are very uh, controversial. And uh, we don't really tend to do unless uh, it's in a, you know, we are pushed uh, in an extreme case to either do some psychosynthesis and uh, bladder shunt. 
But what is extremely important is selection of cases, uh, because only when we select our cases correctly are we able to help them to some extent, at least to prevent or reduce the possibility of, uh, you know, uh, early dysplasia or early renal failure and uh, pulmonary hypoplasia. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Pradima. This is a wonderful uh, talk. Uh, so uh, I have a question. Uh, sure. So regarding this uh, termination of uh, pregnancy, uh, in especially in the PUV children, sometimes we see that uh, parents miss the bus of the 24 weeks. Sometimes and, uh, the doesn't... parents miss the bus of the 24 weeks. Yes, Maybe they yes. present you at 25 or, uh, you know, at 25 weeks when they're present. And you know this child is uh, definitely having a poor prognostic uh, factor. So what do we do then? See, I think uh, that's a very good question. And it is very, very important for all of us to be aware now that the Medical Termination of Pregnant Act has been amended. In 2021, the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act has been amended. And there is a medical board that sits in every state. Every state. So if you have a good, valid reason that the outcome of this pregnancy is going to be really bad, right? You have to approach the medical board and the medical board does give permission. And we have had a uh, you know, case where you know they gave a permission even at 32 weeks because the diagnosis was oh. very late, unfortunately. And this is not uncommon. This is not uncommon. Uh, and you know, even in my case that I showed you at 30 weeks, that baby was delivered and then uh, had a neonatal death. Uh, but unfortunately, yeah, the baby was born alive. But as I said, fortunately, you know, the baby would have had a very poor quality of life uh, with that condition. So I think um, one should take permission and then stop the pregnancy. In extreme yeah. cases, experts have to give that opinion, right? So for me, when I counsel a couple, I tell them, do the genetic testing. If you have a proven genetic abnormality, right? Then it becomes very easy for all clinicians to say that this is bad and this is going to have a bad uh, outcome. So then there is, it's clear cut. So you have to have a case that is properly presented to the medical board. That's the most important thing. No, the word, you use the word genetic uh, in valid and good reason. Yes. Who, who's a valid, who would be the valid and good uh, opinion about that? Who decides that? This is, a, this is a fetus which will not survive. Or if it survives, it's going to have a, a, a no, poor no. outcome. If there is a genetic test that has been done and you have proven that this is a genetic abnormality, right? A proven genetic abnormality. So the basically amniocentesis, you have done a genetic analysis, the baby is affected and that is that shows clearly shows that this particular gene is present in this baby, which is the reason for the condition that it has. So the geneticist gives his opinion, the uh, nephrologist gives the opinion, but I mean, usually the obstetrician, radiologist, uh, and, and the specialist of that particular system which is affected. For example, for the cardiac, it will be the cardiologist. For the renal, it, will, it should be the nephrologist. For the surgical cases, it will be the pediatric surgeon. For, uh, for our case, where we had a baby that was detected with a cardiac defect uh, very late, we had a cardiologist and a pediatrician on the medical board, along with an obstetrician. So they have to be there and they have to give their expert opinion. So that is chosen by the court. Because they are doing genetic studies in situations like this, and quite often it's not it's not easy because of the cost factor, and you are not very sure what you're going to get. The patient asks you, "If you days you test, will you be able to tell me, doctor?" In such situations, very difficult to do a genetic test. So the absence of a genetic study is there any, is there any possibility of giving an opinion on that case? Very difficult. It is very difficult because uh, the opinion will be varied, right? If you don't have a genetic test that has been done and proven, it would be very difficult because, again, uh, you know, one person will say, okay, the amniotic fluid and bladder is normal because these are the only surrogate markers that you can go antenatal because there's we don't assess the renal function routinely. Now, one thing is you can do amniotic fluid analysis of the and show that the kidneys and the uh, uh, the urine osmolality is very low or the sodium is high, uh, you know, the kidneys are not concentrating, kidneys are not functioning, you can prove renal failure to an extent, right? Uh, so that may help, 
but there are now several genetic tests that are available now that can help us make the uh, diagnosis because now we have chromosomal microarray we have exome sequencing and we have got a good genetic team uh, across the country where they will put all their heads and uh, expertise together to be able to give us a uh, you know uh, a reasonable i would not say conclusion but at least a re reasonable prognosis for these babies uh so coming to that point and i'm just uh, uh genetic analysis uh, most of the times in celiopathies or uh, cystic disease is possible but once we take it as uh, the cacuds like uh, say the hypoplastic kidneys or uh, uh, puvs uh, then uh, or single kidney status in those condition genetic analysis what is your stand on a single kidney or all the developmental anomalies I'll see, to be honest, for the hydronephrosis, PUJ obstruction, PUV, you know, those ones, I really don't offer a lot of genetic tests because most of these are anatomical problems, right? It's the parenchymal diseases that are most likely associated with uh, genetic abnormalities, right? The renal tubular uh, dysgenesis or the, uh, even if in unilateral multicystic dysplastic kidney, the other kidney is normal. So I don't offer them genetic testing uh, routinely. Right now, uh, it's not that every single case of renal problem we offer a uh, genetic case, but parenchymal involvement I do worry more because those are the ones that we cannot predict the function, and those are the ones that are, may not be associated with an anatomical obstruction, right? Uh, which okay, even, you know they can they can progress into end stage renal disease. So what about the hypoplastic uh, kidneys? Uh, sometimes we do come across hypoplastic yeah, bilateral kidneys with normal liker. Yeah, to be very honest, antenatally, we don't see that many hypoplastic kidneys, right? In uh, antenatal, Small kidneys. Yes, we don't see that many. I have a family. I have a family where, yeah. I know, there's a family where uh, the elder, elder sibling was bilateral hypoplastic, uh, small kidneys, normal liker. Uh, so, and then this child is on follow up, and now the child is around uh, four years old. Still, the kidneys are small for age, but as of now, child uh, reactin and is holding, and the urinary parameters are normal. The so, child also, uh, younger sibling who again has a bilateral uh, small uh, kidneys. So, such uh, conditions, what do we generally do? In fact, this this is a classical example of a genetic problem, right? Because it is running in the family. So this family needs a genetic evaluation and check the, uh, you know, what is, you know, what is it that is responsible for that? Uh, because small kidneys, the problem is if you see something big on the scan is very visible. Something which is small may not be visible. Maybe we are, we are overdiagnosed. We are probably calling them renal agenesis or non-visualization of the kidney, right? So uh, probably those are the really small ones that you cannot see because they are below the uh, penetration of the ultrasound or below the resolution of the ultrasound, right? So, so you know, I, I, that's the only thing I can think because something which is big and enlarged, we can see, right? But if it is running in the family, I would suggest doing a genetic evaluation there because to understand that, because that's very interesting. I have not come across something like that. Any other questions? Uh, I, any chat questions the chat box? Okay. So and I think uh, the chat box, Doctor Sudha. Like, uh, can I read out? The no, it's a. Yeah, it's not a quiz. Okay, you can go ahead. Uh, if the poor renal function can be proven by fetal urine analysis, can that be a reason presented for termination? Um. Well, <laughs> uh, you you have to be sure. Yes, I mean, uh, it's just not only that. I think it's a multiple things because i would be very hesitant to say that one thing can cause you know can lead to termination it should be the spectrum of the problem that is there uh, it should be the you know the uh, of course urine analysis is helpful but uh, it can't be the only thing but uh, yes i mean it I could be helpful it be complementary
But questions. when we approach the medical board, we should have a really good, solid reason because the worst thing that can happen is for them to reject us, right? But if you have a good uh, support and good reason to terminate the pregnancy, then they do agree and they're very reasonable people. I think if there are no more questions, can we conclude, Dr. Clement? Yeah, yeah. Like we have polling session. I think. Uh, okay. Namalvasa, do you have any questions, sir? Um, Namalvasa Amrish. Sir, you're muted, sir. Namalvasa, you're, you're no, muted. No, I don't have. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. And I know it's quite a challenge to have somebody outside the uh, specialty to come and give a talk. Uh, thank you very much for having me on board. And it's really an honor and a pleasure to have you know, have interacted with all of you. And I heard Dr. Sripati's lecture before was very, very inspiring. My husband happens to be a pediatric surgeon. So I... That's great. I play on with him a little bit. Not much. We don't talk shop at home. <laughs> we enjoyed your talk too. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Sudha, for the excellent Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Kalai. Thank you so much, Dr. Sudha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sudha. Bye. So, so uh, yeah, can I uh, leave? Like, yeah, yeah, can I exit? Yeah, yeah, you, you can exit. Bye. Like, we are just going to go ahead with the polling session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So now we'll move ahead with the polling questions. So the instruction of the polling session is like we are into webinar six today and we have we are into the polling session five and total is 10 questions and we are going to have only six minutes to answer all the 10 questions and uh, we have three star questions. And the poll is going to start now. So it's going to be six minutes from now.
three more minutes. Last 20 seconds. So we'll close the polling session. Yeah, so this is the end of the polling session. Uh, thank you all for joining. And we will see you all uh, on Saturday for a session on antenatal hydronephrosis. So looking forward to seeing you back again. Thank you so much. Thank you.